The fact that a Glasgow-based uh, young girl, uh, Muslim, has left the city, whatever the reasons and whatever, whatever the argument about what radicalised her or, or what happened and where she is now, those two questions are in one. The fact that we now realise, we are now talking about it, the fact that you know, we're talking about the mosques as well. I mean, I, I, I've been going to mosques all my life. Um, and, and the points that were made that, apart from the five pillars, they don't really want to talk about everyday issues that young people and, and even anybody that have to go through. I think that needs to be encouraged. Um, the fact that the, the, the young girl leaving feeling isolated, that community spirit is there. It's just the fact that now we need to recognise that um, we need to step up. Again, what was said earlier on, it's one individual out of thousands that haven't gone, but the fact, the impact that's leaving in our lives and in the family's lives uh, is far, far greater. And the fact that we're talking about it, you're now more aware that is what we want to encourage uh, as, as well. And as a panel, I think that's, that, that would be an agreement that that's what we want to encourage. Uh, more of this kind of thing, more awareness. Uh, we don't panic about it, but we, 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 we deal with it. We understand that these things are happening. And I'd like to just make a quick point on the internet and a bit about the, the reasons, not the reasons of how radicalization takes place. Nobody can give you an exact answer. Sometimes radicalization is taking place, the only time you'll realise it is when it's happened, when it's finished, the end product. Uh, as with Aksa Mahmoud leaving the city, that's when you realise what's happened. And um, the third question, I'll leave that to, to my colleague. We really need to be having our mosques as being the centre of activity, the centre of political activity, the centre of discussion, being the centre of organisations of demonstrations rather than constantly shying away from it. And then when an issue like this happens, what was with the greatest respect, the response of Central Mosque. The response of Central Mosque was to say, she's a stupid girl and she never came to our mosque. What, if anybody from our community feels that they have a right to comment on Aksa Mahmoud's family or on her daughter, they should also then engage with the family and offer their support, rather than just simply issuing a statement, running for cover, and thinking it's nothing to do with us because actually that's not the role of a mosque. That's not the role of the Muslim community. So I think it is a disgrace that people from the community haven't stepped forward, but also I have to tread carefully because sometimes it's difficult because when issues like this happen to families, people in the community think, well, maybe they wouldn't want somebody knocking on the door saying, what can we do, prying in, etc. But I'll say this, my view over the years of 25-year campaigning is you don't know until you knock on someone's door and say, is there anything I can do to help you? At the end of the day, our community is usually number one in charity, usually number one in providing support for people in Palestine when there's floods in Pakistan, earthquakes, etc. We should be helping those brothers and sisters in our community that actually need help. And the question of the Imperial Masters, um, if you haven't watched the, the YouTube video, then put, uh, watch it. And I'm sure the brother there will give you a link to that. But, but, I, I, but I think in terms of fundamental, on, on a serious note, there's a question of double standards. Because um, when you come to the war in Iraq, when you come to the war in Afghanistan, and the brother's quite right in terms of freedom fighters, one day somebody's a freedom fighter, the next day they're a terrorist. It didn't bother them a great deal when they funded, trained and armed the Mujahideen in Afghanistan because they were fighting the Russians. They didn't stop to think once they pulled the, you know, the, the resources out that what happens next in terms of the infrastructure of Afghanistan. They didn't concern them when the CIA were training Osama bin Laden you know, um, to, to go out and fight against Russians and using whatever logic or reason he tried to justify his actions. And certainly when it comes down to, I mean, it's the 13th anniversary of 9-11 um, of and to this day, you know, we, see a, we saw the Americans and we saw the coalition that's been rustled up again in terms of declaring war on ISIS and uh, in, in Iraq. And, uh, and one of the co-partners, fundamentally the most important part that the Americans were talking about was Saudi Arabia. Well, we're creating such a fuss, quite rightly, about the barbaric actions of ISIS in two beheadings of um, the, the American journalists. The Saudis have been, have been beheading a person every single day in the public square, sometimes for petty crimes, with no real justice, with no accountability, and with no democracy. They represent the most extreme end of 
um, uh, so-called theological teaching, yet there seems to be no criticism of that. And on one hand, we have people who they regard as barbaric. On the other hand, we have people that we regard as our partners. And the single key issue, I think, when it came to if you want to challenge Al-Qaeda, if you want to show a way forward, actually has already happened. It was in Terek Square. It was when the Egyptians rose up and uh, demanded land and equality and bread, etc. And it wasn't saying that we want the black flag flying or anything like that. Actually, what they were demanding was the same as us. Um, and they wanted support. And what did our governments do? Cameron landed there. They all landed there to sell guns and weapons. And then they all tried to do their deals. And we have Egypt. Well, there's a new pharaoh back in Egypt in charge. And the same across the rest of the Middle East. And unless we actually step up to the plate and hold those imperial masters to account for their double standards, unfortunately, young children will watch the TV screens. And the, fortunately, the majority will not take that, that solution or the end result. But some of them, a minority, will take the wrong step and go in that direction because they think, well, we need to teach these people a lesson. Unless we get down to those core issues, then, then we're never going to resolve it. And the imperial masters can be taken on because you often think you can't stop them. Vietnam was stopped on the basis of a coalition of students oppressed of anti-war movements around the world that brought the world's biggest superpower to its knees. We defeated South Africa apartheid on the basis of the same coalition. And we can do this again if we realize we unite. Families always keep issues at home. They never like to go out. We know that. I mean, if that happened within our family, we would be in a very much similar catch-22 situation. Should we? Should we not? Should we ask for help or should we manage it ourselves? But sometimes, you know, we can't manage. We've got to go out and ask people for help as well. Um, so again, as I said, same with the prison work that I do. Families tell, the, you, know, the, you know, I ask them, what have you told your family where your young person is for the next three months, four months? They'll make up, you know, he's away to Pakistan or he's away to stay with his cousin in Manchester for three months, but he's sitting in a prison. So it's, it's an issue where, as I said, where families have to be more aware that there is support for them. And these issues that are out there have to be addressed as it, can, it, was, hi, uh, as it was highlighted. What should happen to us and many other people, to Britain particularly? I know the, Mr. Cameron and his crew had the Cobra meeting. As soon as something happens, it all kicks off and they'll say, when you see these people come back, we've got to tackle them, we've got to deal with them. It's interesting, I was reading something in Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and I think it's in Holland as well. They've got a rehabilitation program for, for terrorists, for extremists. Why can we not do that? Why can we not be these people a part of our society again? Yeah, they went out for whatever reason, and it said it could have been just a situation where they went out just to help, just to support, but unfortunately with the status quo that's happening there, they've been caught in it, and they know themselves sometimes it's difficult to leave a situation where they're in. So we should look at where we can support people like that, as well as a young person, also the family. And, um, you know, families should be aware, people should be aware that there is support out there. Um, is it from the mosques? Like, then that's a question that we're sure we can ask and we can talk about, but however, there is support, people, 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 people seek it, there is, there is out there. Okay, um, I'll come on to the IDF uh, question first. Uh, it's really defence force, and that's what the, the brother's mentioning there. So people going out to fight for the IDF. Obviously, this is in relation to people with dual nationality, and they go over to Israel, and, and, and uh, they, they either do national service or join up. Uh, my, my answer to that question uh, is quite clear. There's a big difference between a state-funded no matter what the, 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 the opinions of, of the state may be or the actions of the IDF, and, and we, we have our opinions on that, to fight with a national army like the IDF and a big difference from joining uh, an extremist group, a revolutionary group that's bringing down a government of a country, no matter what kind of government that may be, there is a big difference between somebody fighting for ISIS, for example, and fighting for the IDF. And continuing on that point, anybody in this room has dual nationality with any home country, uh, or their, their forefathers, uh, say Pakistan, India, wherever, can go and do five years uh, in the Pakistani army, for example, and then come back and, and, and continue their life. There may be, we have our opinions of the, the ideology behind that, but to, to kind of nip this question in the bud or answer it, you know, you can't compare fighting for IDF and fighting for ISIS. Uh, that can't be compared. Um, I want to go on to the, the humanitarian question about the ambulance drivers as well. The main advice from the police and obviously from the, the government is 
uh, not to go to Syria for any reason, mainly because the situation over there, how dire it is, how dangerous it is, no consular services, people get stuck, people get kidnapped, uh, and, and uh, worst uh, things that are happening, and obviously with the current uh, situation with the kidnapped British uh, person there as well. The status of what happens if somebody's going over there or coming back, like I say, first of all, the advice is not to go. How to get involved? Humanitarian work. Register charities uh, in Britain. Many charities are doing a lot of good work, not maybe just in Syria, but in the surrounding countries, Turkey, Jordan, um, and even in Iraq. Now, the status is of somebody who's been over there and coming back, well, case by case basis, depends what's, what, what, what's happened, what the information is. There's still people that are Syrian that live in Britain that have family in Syria and they do want to go and see their, their, their loved ones or they want to see them in Turkey. And I've spoke to somebody recently who's Syrian who said to me, Shaheen, I can't uh, make so-and-so meeting because I'm going to Turkey because I'm meeting my family because his family in Syria are traveling to Turkey so they can get together. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis. There's a big difference between somebody going out there and there's information that they're going out there for jihad uh, or to fight. Uh, or to join up an extremist group than somebody going on there to humanitarian. So case by case basis. Thank you. There's very simple, you know, principles in Islam which tell you don't do this because there's one thing first is the, the hadith of the Prophet that if two Muslims start fighting each other, both of them are in hellfire. Why? One of them killed the other one. And the Sahaba asked the Prophet the one is killed the other one. Why about, what about the one who's been killed? I said, because his intention was to kill the other one. So if we're going to fight Muslim, fighting Muslims, that, that's the worst thing anyone can do. Whether it's cause right or wrong, that's, that's something which makes it simple for us. The other one is that even in simple matters of Amr ibn Ma'uf and Nahi al-Munkar, which is enjoining good and forbidding evil, the, the, the scholars say that, of course, uh, or Sheikh uh, Adwan is here as well, is that if your advice and work to stop some wrong thing will bring something even worse, then just leave it. So th th there's a lot of wisdom in, in learning about Islam and behaving about Islam in, in this matter. So first, don't go to fight Muslim for, for Muslim. Don't make uh, a correction which will bring even more evil. And, and that's, that's enough. We don't need to listen to other ones. Of course, I know there's lots of conflicting messaging, messages coming from the media, from the government, from policies, etc. And that's why I'm trying to find the simple way as an individual to say, I will behave this way. And of course, other things we can work on after that. Anybody who goes and fights with the IDF is engaging with an organization that is conducting systematic genocide and murder um, of, of the Palestinian people. So I hope one day what we do get to a situation that those who are in the IDF, if they return to this country after fighting the IDF, that they should be prosecuted. But we need to change our imperial masters and we need to change the laws in this country to be able to take that place. But I would say in, in the context of the law, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights actually tells you that it's appropriate to overthrow a tyrant as a last resort that it's appropriate to support an entity that is able to claim self-determination. Uh, and that is also a principle in Islam. But the law post 9-11 has now changed. And any attempt to overthrow any government anywhere in the world now is considered terrorism. So the problem that we have is that there are gray areas um, and the government picks and chooses around the planet who you can, who you can't, if you're Kurdish, if you're Syrian, if you're Iraqi, if you're Iranian, etc. Who they can, who can't go in, who can't do this, whatever. And that's the problem of it. So recommendation that I have to give to, to individuals all the time, as, as she will do, is like, it's not worth it on one level. Because you go out there, you come back, it's a question of who you're going to engage with, where you're going to go. And that, that same principle applies with charities. I've, I've had a number of people in our office who've been seeking advice, because often what happens is, as the brother there uh, asked about knowing people, etc., anybody engaged with these charities, as it exists at this point in time with Syria, that police officers will inevitably, police officers are present today, they're present in the audience, will inevitably want to ask you questions. It's not a question of being a war on Islam, 
It's a question of they need the information, they need the intelligence, because people are using charities as a front in order to get out to Syria, in order to engage and join in ISIS or engage in acts of terrorism or genocide, whatever you want to call it. As a result of that, they are entitled under the law to ask those questions. And the number one piece of advice that people can give is there are already professional organizations out there on the ground who've been doing it for years who can do best. The best thing you can do is to raise a charity and to raise the money and to put that into those charities in order to do it. But I understand that people want to go out. They're not doing anything wrong. They can't be stopped going out. And if you're being questioned by the police repeatedly, then they, they also are, I suppose, not doing, it's not often I say this, but not doing anything wrong because they're trying to gather intelligence because they don't know who's going out for real to help and who's actually going out to join an organization. Yeah, I think the issue of the, the sectarian issue is an important one. I mean, early Islamic history shows one thing that people, Muslims, could disagree and they could just change the pillar where they sat. I mean, Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, taught in Basra, he had theological circles and if somebody disagreed with him and actually created their own, their own sect, they, what they would do is move to another pillar of the mosque. In other words, they wouldn't set up another mosque, they wouldn't set up another Islamic state, they wouldn't kill their teacher, which shows the kind of ethics of engagement that our, our Prophet Ali taught his companions that was passed down from generations and this is the people that we study with and we saw that sectarianism, if there is a sect, it doesn't mean that you have animosity and hostility. We studied, I mean all the years I've studied, we never had classes on how to refute another sect. That's, that's, that's not surprising, that's, that's, I mean when I came back I realised that. But if you go to Saudi Arabia for example, the majority, majority of the ma master's degrees and PhDs are, are refutations on such and such a deviant sect. And that's a state university in a, in a country which has produced imams that, that have basically saturated the Muslim world. And they're not the people that radicalize people, but they're the people that tell you that if that person is not praying in a certain way, you shouldn't really pray behind that person. Also, you should start your own mosque. And it's a very small step from that epistemic distance that you have with a person and then saying, well, that person, I don't think that person is a Muslim. Okay, well, so what does it mean not to be a Muslim? It means that they're an apostate, or oh, what does it mean? Let's look this up in, in up the engine. Let's Google what an apostate, death. Yes, that's it. Let's go. Okay, boys, let's get the knives. That is basically how, that's the kind of situation we're working with. I mean, I went to Yemen in 1997, and there was people from Britain there that had no idea about their faith. Big beards, lovely thobes, but you speak to them for 10 minutes, and you realize these people have no idea what they're doing. And they were just collecting at the airport, waiting to be taken up to northern Yemen to be trained. Now, the issue about sectarianism is that we have to discuss that there are sects in Islam and you have, to, you have to have the broad church of our faith. We don't have a church. The interesting about Islam is we don't have a, a, a set church. We don't have a pope, which means it's, it's, a, it's a faith that really empowers a scholar to think for themselves. But also what it does is it says that you as a scholar are on an arena with so many other scholars that have opinions and you have to share that, that space the only play time you don't spare that, share that space is when it becomes an issue of the public good and other people are fighting other people. You have to defend yourself. The issue of jihad is an interesting one because jihad is not broken down. I, mean, I don't personally think it's broken down to defensive and offensive. Jihad is that, 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 that concept of defending and preserving. And if in a certain situation you cannot defend by your writing, by you know, speaking, then at a certain point you have to do that with force of arms. But the thing about Islamic law, what it recognizes is that there's parity and there's nation states and how the world works is the way that you work. There's, there's such a thing as you know, treaties and you have to abide by treaties. And that's the infrastructure within which Muslims have to, like it or not, they have to operate. You can't just have every, every city in the Muslim world deciding that they want to create an Islamic state and then they have to fight the, the country that they're part of. You can't have that for the basic reason that you cannot create dissension. Ibn Taymiyyah, who's, who's, a, who's a mouthpiece of extremists, said 60 years under a tyrant is better than one, one, one day with a, a, a leader. Do you understand? So it's a question of peace. And, I mean, look at the situation in Syria, which is why the majority of scholars in Syria, all they said was defend yourself, um, speak up for your rights, but do not create civil dissension. And that was the position of the scholars in the city, in the country itself, the people that knew what was happening. So jihad is one issue, but the other issue was the other issue you mentioned. There was three points you kind of went on to. I mean, that, I kind of touched on that on the, on, on, in the issue of is an Islamic state a rukun of, of our religion? If you study basic creed, 
you understand that the establishment of, a, of an Islamic legal system is not um, it's not a rukun, it's not like a pillar of the faith. It's something that Allah facilitates everything else. But if you establish an Islamic state, say for example, and, and by doing that, you desecrate all the other pillars of your faith, which is the right of people to live in safety, to have property, to have life, then that's not an Islamic state. Whatever it is, I don't care what it is, but it's not an Islamic state. Because one of the things Muslims have to realize is we're being tested by God. I mean, this is all a, is a political discussion. It's about community cohesion. It's about all this stuff. But at the end of the day, as Muslims, I mean, this is a perspective. You're a Muslim. We're being tested in a way I don't think any, any Muslim community was tested in a different way. Physically, perhaps not. But in terms of avenues to, to act, they're very restricted. And we have to be very careful how we treat our, our, our teachings, how we treat the ethical teachings of the Prophet and we're being tested. I mean, how can we respond to these things? We have to think outside the box. We have to really put in our human resources. Everybody around the table here is our people that are, that are community activists. They're, they're taking time out for a greater common good. And I think people, everybody in sitting in the audience, they have to start to step up to, step up to the mark as well. You well, the, I mean, I stood, I mean, the day my daughter was born, my second daughter, Rukhaya, was born, I had an appointment to do a Q&A in Edinburgh, so I travelled all the way, saw my daughter, gave her a kiss, went to Edinburgh, and there was somebody heckling me at the front of the, front of the actual audience, heckled me again and again and again, and when we left, I, I grabbed his hand, and outside for about an hour and a half, I, I, I spoke with him. I wouldn't let go of his hand, because he was saying, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't respect you, you know, you have not, you've not studied, and for an hour and a half, I stood there and I, I spoke with him, until he said he'll study with me. Now, if I wasn't able to physically speak to him, of course he's going to say that, Twitter, Facebook, but the thing they fear is coming face to face. That's what they fear. And the nature of human society is that you do things face to face. And this is why I think ground, ground, grassroots education is so important. You can, you can become radicalized online. Not radicalized, but you can see an outlet for your radical views, but you cannot fall out of that except by touching base with a human being. And I think that's one of the things we have to, uh, in terms of this case of Aqsa, we have to keep that door open for her. In terms of supporting her family, that's an absolute must. But also, we have to be very wary of politicians creating a situation, a scenario where, as a community, we're scared to say we want to have her back in the community. And even the family itself, I mean, they, it's, it's one thing shunning a daughter, but it's another thing deep down in their hearts wanting that daughter to come back. And as a community, if they can't say it in that way, then we should facilitate saying that in that way because at the end of the day, if she was impressionable, she should be allowed an avenue back. A lot of the kids were responding negatively to the word Islam, or even they were looking at images of girls in hijab and labeling them as terrorists and things like that. And she was getting very upset at the language that the kids were using. So she asked us to come in um, now that is part of the work that we do with Amina anyway, is to going into schools and talking about Islam and tackling stereotypes. So that's one thing that can be done in um, a local community level. Um, in terms of young girls like Aqsa, of course, um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of supporting young Muslim girls. Um, there's groups already that exist, like I mentioned earlier, young Muslims, um, trying to build some sort of support network. And like, um, like Bala Amr mentioned, um, trying to utilise young people's energy in a positive way. So there's that kind of thing of going to Syria and doing jihad, but that's not what Sheikh and everybody else has mentioned. That's not, that's not the right way or the right approach at all. But you know, you, you, using kind of trying to fundraise, to trying to send money over, writing letters to your MP, like um, Bala Amr was saying, you're trying to change the political system to make foreign pol policy uh, an, uh, an issue that needs to be fought with. So in terms of political, writing to your MP, um, going to demonstrations, so maybe young people can be encouraged to kind of use their energy in that way. Um, like somebody else mentioned as well, Facebook has been a big, a big tool in terms of the Gaza situation. So maybe trying to get the young people to utilise their energy again through ways that are safe and appropriate. Um, there's a service down south that again is trying to facilitate and using young people and trying to support them in a way that is positive and practical for them. And it's a helpline service 
where young people can phone up anonymously and it doesn't appear on their phone line either about any issues that they have, any concerns that they have. Um, so it's something maybe that we need to look into in Scotland as well. Maybe there's something, if there's not enough support group out there, they may be having some sort of anonymous helpline where people can call up and young people can express some of their issues and concerns. But again, uh, again, in some cases it probably is, but in some cases I would say it isn't because you have to be in a safe place. You have to be somewhere where you know, things like that do not change you in the sense that there's either two ways you can go. Either as you can kind of say you can have extreme views from what happens because sometimes you don't know the whole picture and other ways you can just be complacent and just let, you know, it's to them, to them and to us, it's to us sort of thing. So you can, it, can, it can go either way, these images. But for a young person to see these images, and again, I think, and this is where, kind of going back to what we kind of spoke about at the start, you know, end of the day, we're talking about here, and I think for all of us sitting here, I think it's the issue about, you know, we don't want to see more young people go or be, or be radicalised. And it's right now, today's ISIS. Last year, last time it was, you know, as, you know, the Iraq war, pre previous to that, it was, as you said, Afghanistan. Previous to that was Bosnia. All these conflicts have happened so many. And there'll be another conflict. Give it another five years, ten years. There'll be another conflict somewhere again. And we'll be talking about this topic again, about radicalization. We're talking about another generation of you know, people being radicalized. So really, it's not, it's not so much what's going on more than what we're doing about it and how we can change it and where we can change it. And certainly social media is one of the things that's changed the whole ethos of the way things work. It's just the whole, whole different mechanism there. Um, because as I said, it's on your phones, it's constant, it's something that we can see all the time everywhere we go. We're updated minute by minute. When did that ever happen during you know, the previous conflicts? Right now, you know, there's, there's a war. We can watch it live sitting here in Glasgow and Iraq. We can watch a conflict live happening anywhere in the world. Where was that 10, 15, 20 years ago? It wasn't happening. We'd get information that would tell us, you know, this has happened or that's happened. So for young people, first they're bombarded with all this information. And when you're bombarded with so much information, what do you do with that? Where does that information go? You know yourself. Where does all that go in the head? It's going somewhere. It's not, it's not being deleted. You don't press a button and go, delete this and I'll delete that and I'll delete this. It's going somewhere. So as a community, as professionals, as people who are supporting people in the community, we should be looking at that and asking the questions, where is that, what, what, what's happening to people? What's happening to young people who watch these images? What's the psyche, what's going on? You know, is it, is it a good thing? Is it, I don't know, I, I, I just honestly don't know the answer if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but what's happened to the psyche of young people? And then what will happen for years to come when there'll be another conflict? I just want to kind of uh, pick on this point and I'll do it very quickly, obviously you want to move on to the floor. This watching videos online watching the news with graphic images. Sometimes I watch the news like Al Jazeera and you watch during the Israeli-Gaza conflict and you see kids' images or so, then you know, you're know you turning it over or, or, or you're, you're able to process it. But the online stuff, which obviously you haven't watched, uh, Aman, um, it's stuff that is difficult to process for the average person. Now, being very careful how I explain this, and I don't want to stigmatise any section of the community, but you know, for young people who are inexperienced and still developing in life, and if they're watching these images, how are they processing as shock it says it's going in somewhere? Somebody a bit more experienced, a bit more experienced in life or age, uh, may be able to handle those images slightly better, they may, you know, go and get upset and they may go and, you know, pray or, or whatever else and they process these images that are bombarded in the head. Uh, young people, um, some uh, may have, and again, watching how I say this, you know, some mental health, some, you know, issues that, you know, can't process those and they get emotional and then they want to do something about it and that is another indicator, not indicator, another cause of the radicalisation process as well is how do you process that information? And again, going finally to the social media aspect of it, absolutely correct what Shock is saying. 10 years ago, we didn't have this issue. Imagine your eight, nine, 10 year old walking about with smartphones. It's not just the extremist websites or their 24 hour news. We've got other, we've got child exploitation online uh, issues. Th this is, we have to embrace it. Internet isn't the cause. Internet doesn't cause radicalization. It's just a method. 
and it's a method that's in our homes, in the bedroom. You know, kids are watching images all the time. Um, I know people that have to ask their children to leave their phones and their iPods and their iPads downstairs before they go to bed upstairs because half the night they're playing games or they're connected to somebody on the other end of the world. Uh, this, is the, this is the cause of social media. We can't censor it. We can't stop. I wouldn't want anybody to stop using the internet, but this is where education comes in. We need to educate and we need to educate ourselves as well. Parents need to educate themselves what the internet is and how dangerous it can be. And the, and the young people need to be taught how to use the internet and that is a part of education uh, helpline you mentioned there which is a, i think it's a great idea um, uh, in japan and south korea apparently they have rehab facilities for kids that are addicted to online gaming four or five days non-stop without eating without sleeping and they're addicted to these games this is what we need to tackle the radicalization side and sorry the, the you know no, lack of knowledge of islam so that, that that is part of it as well it's not just one solution there's a whole series of solutions that we need here. The idea that we um, want to fight a war on terror, but then we deny any responsibility for British citizens that want to return home, to me smacks of double standards and hypocrisy. And I remember how this country moaned and groaned for some seven years about the likes of Abu Hamza, demanding that as he was a foreign national who had glorified terrorism, who had incited terrorism in our country, he should be booted out. And they screamed about it from the rooftops. So I wonder when, why it is then we should be allowed as a country to wash our hands of British citizens who stand accused of inciting or engaging in terrorism or acts of genocide abroad. And, and when you come back to the question of, of acts, many of um, the people I say who are, many young people who perhaps start as keyboard wannabe jihadists, uh, a term that was coined, that we coined for, for AXA was a bedroom radical. They get groomed, however it may be, whether it be online or whether it be they meet an individual, where they go down south and they get out onto somebody, and they take it one step further. Now, I, I believe that as the, the individual that Zubair talked about and others, those who are returning, could be a real rich source of intelligence. They could provide the details of who their groomers were of which websites it was, or who the contacts were. And imagine, and I also wonder why it is that if, if there was any other group of young people in our society, not Muslim, but any other young group of people who were being groomed by some cult, who were being taken out of this country, we would be doing everything possible to rescue them. And these are young people who I believe have been brainwashed, who are deluded. Um, and we run the real risk that if we don't provide the support mechanisms, if it's all about prosecute, hang them out to dry, tear up their passports, don't let them back in. The real concern I have, as Shaheen says, is that we run the real risk of families never ever telling the authorities that their child has left, right? And never ever telling the authorities that their child is trying to get back because they're fair that they will never get back into the country. And then we have a real issue then. Because if we're really concerned about protecting public safety in this country, then if we don't know, because the bottom line here comes down to, for instance, AXA. The security services don't actually know how many exactly people have gone out to Syria or have gone out to Iraq. Often it takes the good faith of the families to contact the police and say, we have a concern, and then it's checked out, and then they find out that they've actually gone. If that process dries up, the intelligence dries up, and then out of those individuals, I'll say this. When they go there, the passports are torn up, so they tear up their social contract with this country. But those who decide they've had enough and that they want to come back means that they regain the social contract with this country, which means that they need support. And it is, Shaheen's right, on a case-by-case -case basis, because many people have argued with me in the media and said to me, oh, well, what about those who are engaged in suicide bombings and beheadings? I said, well, if it was suicide bombing, they wouldn't be coming back for a start. Um, and if it's beheadings, then it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, they would meet, I, I doubt those individuals would be coming back because they've gone so far ahead that they wouldn't. But those who want to come back, it, uh, it is difficult for society to view them as victims, but they are victims. And we do want them back home. They are young people. Their families do want them back home. And I would much rather that they were back home in this country, being provided support, being monitored by our security services, rather than somebody else's country engaging in torture, murder, or, or genocide. And, uh, which brings me on to the question of, of how to support um, families like Aksa's family. Uh, and what I would say as well, you know, these families used our local mosques. I think it's imperative that our local mosques do offer support. 
the very first thing that an individual could do from these mosques is, rather than giving grand statements to the press, is to knock on the door of the family's house and say, you know, just to go to the house, to pray with them, to offer them support and offer solidarity. There are, I, I've heard many stories of what a, a lovely, young, bubbly, intelligent girl AXA was. And there's many friends in the community of AXA who also could knock on the door. And maybe if the family wants to speak to you, then fine, but at least you've tried. And those friends should reach out to her mother and to her father and say, you know, we're here for you. You know, we remember your daughter the way she was. Um, and of course, her mom and dad have every right to want her to come home. Um, and, I, and I'm conscious of the fact, I remember a case I dealt with many years ago, Muhammad Atif Sadiq, that when Atif, who was a 21-year-old boy, who I described on the steps of the court when he was convicted in 2007, um, was convicted and was sentenced to eight years. And I came out on the steps of the court. And I remember dealing with that case over the course of the year that every lawyer, every institution that dealt with was like, oh, you know, there's no smoking gun, he's a terrorist, he's this and that. I said, no, he's a stupid boy. He's a young boy who went on the internet searching for answers. And as a result of this so-called war on terror, he is also one of its victims. But I remember categorically how it was everybody ran for cover when Atif was convicted. That nobody in the mosque, nobody in the community wanted to stand shoulder to shoulder with his family. I remember arguing with people in the community, you must come to the trial. They did not want to come to the trial, with a few honourable exceptions. I remember saying to our representatives uh, from the mosque, and uh, political representatives, please come along, they didn't want him. And then when he was convicted, it was a case of no. And then it became me that was put on trial for saying that he was an innocent man. And, and eventually that was overturned and then we freed Atif and then all of a sudden everybody came experts saying, oh yeah, this, this is wrong and all that. We shouldn't wait, you know, for the miscarriages to happen. We shouldn't, shouldn't wait for somebody's child to get blown up and to appear on the front page of a newspaper. Those families need the support now because it's extremely difficult. They may say no, they may say yes, but at least if you ask, then you know you've actually asked and tried to do something about it. Because otherwise, see these meetings here? They're pointless because th then we're doing nothing other than glorifying in the misery of some other family. Um, what we should actually be doing is taking it one step further and saying, our family, we're here to help you. You are part of our community. She was one of our daughters, one of our sisters, and, and we want to be there for you. In addition to what has been said, that if they are coming back repentant or disillusioned, we should take them from even the human point of view, and we can also use them to say to the others, don't do the mistake which we did. If they are coming back with still some thoughts in their mind, and we are afraid that they will do something evil, then it's better to be under our eye and under our monitoring, whether it's even police, than leaving them outside. Because leaving them outside is going to repeat the same experience which you had with the creation of Al-Qaeda, because Al-Qaeda was created when the, what they called Mujahideen at the time, which was financed and supported by America and Saudi Arabia in the same time, and they were called Mujahideen, and they did the fighting of the Soviet Union. They were not supported because they were fighting for Islam. They were supported because they were fighting the Soviet Union. Once the job is finished, they found themselves in no man's land, and they found that all their countries, at the time there wasn't maybe from this country, but countries in the Middle East said, you're not coming back, or when they come from the airport, straight to jail. And that's what, when they decided, okay, we feed Afghanistan, we we'll free the world, and this is how Al-Qaeda and all this started, and we're repeating it again. So we need to, to think about these things and don't just come with these noises, like they said, don't let them in. And I think the second day, they stopped saying this thing about take their passport and so on, and they realized that this is something wrong anyway. Well, to summarize, I'll just go back to my first point, which is we need to spend a lot of time learning about our faith, about our Islam, in all its aspects, in everything in life. And that will give us the tools to uh, live right and also to not to be swayed by uh, you know, Facebook and uh, these uh, YouTubes and all these things, because in the final event, uh, to possess these things, these uh, pictures and so on, you need something which should be more strong in your background, and that's that you know what is Islam about if 
everything in life. It's not just a few things to do. For me, there's, there's a number of things. First of all, acknowledging that we have an issue. Before I go there, I wanted to say the, 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 the sister there that kind of made a comment about, you know, if this wasn't at some mood, if she didn't go, would we be talking about this today? Well, probably not, but the problem is still going to be there. It's, you know, there's so many cases, especially in England, many of these cases, the families are the ones that reported their children missing. Now, you know, if, the, if there was a cult and, and we'd be there to try to save those uh, young people, if we start thinking along those lines as a community and then as a society, I think then we could maybe tackle this problem, this growing problem, uh, a bit better. You know, these families down south and uh, many fathers, the Cardiff fathers, Birmingham, the twins, I don't know if you know about the, the twins that uh, went out uh, a few months ago, uh, 16 year old girls just disappeared and then the father reported them and turned out that they went to Syria. Um, they'd rather have their children back and if their children have committed some crime and they ended up in, you know, in a British jail, I think I've heard and I've read that some of them would even prefer that than their 16 year old girls or 19 year old sons out in a conflict zone, passports ripped up, um, brutality to the extent of even Al Qaeda saying that ISIS is too extreme for us, all right? It is widely reported. Now you can argue, you know, is that propaganda or whatever? Yeah, maybe so, maybe not. But the point is that's what's out there, you know? This is where we are, right, as a community. It's nobody's fault, it's not the community's fault, it's not, not your fault or my fault that Aksa went out, that's her decision, or the Aberdeen boy, or the Cardiff boys, that's nothing to do with us, and we keep hearing this, and I keep saying as well, why do we have to justify ourselves as a Muslim community? Yeah, we could talk about this for a long, long time, but let's decide this, or think about this. This is where we are, this is the society we're living in, this is the media, we don't have control over the media, we don't have individually control over uh, foreign policy, you know, engage in the political process and then, you know, let your views be known. But at this time, right now, in Glasgow, today, what do we have in our power? The thing we have in our power is our own actions, what we do in our own community and what other people learn from us, what we are doing in our community, be it helplines, be it engaging with young Muslims, with the young people, be it that, that we're energy, uh, you, you know, turning their energies into other areas, sport or you know, um, um, politics, uh, and reducing the pool of vulnerability, the pool that extremists online or physically, but mainly online, that's a common denominator, uh, are using. And let's support our community, our young people especially, a good point that's been made that the majority of the Muslim community are young, under 25. So this could be a problem that we could be dealing with in the next 10, 20 years. Again, kind of going back to the role of parents, which we was kind of asked to talk about. And I think, again, um, it's, it's important, again, that we, you know, the first stage of anything, like, like, um, like Shane was saying, is awareness. You've got to realise there's a situation. If there's no situation, there's no problem. But you've got to realise there's a situation, and sometimes, as I said, with parents, and sometimes it's not just the parents, but our community, we're in denial on a lot of issues as well. Um, so I think the first thing, and kind of going back to what the young sister said about things like this are needed, are they? Yes, they are. And obviously the, the, the thing that we're brought home for us, is, as Shaheen said, is a young girl from Glasgow ended up in Syria. But however, whatever's happened has happened, but for us it's a lesson in that, and we've got to take the lessons out of that in the sense that, you know, what do we do for the future? What do we do looking ahead? How do we support families? As is, 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 uh, Amma kind of touched on, that knocking on the door for people who we know in the community are facing that issue. But there's people in the community that we don't know. There's people in the community who are probably on some fringe or somewhere who are thinking about taking the next step. We don't know these people. Very difficult to find out again, but however, as parents and as a community, we should have some form of support mechanism within the community where we can support people like that if need be. And at the same time, as well, you know, as I said, radicalisation, this whole thing about this thing, is happening uh, within the UK. When you have people like Anjum Chowdhury, people like, you know, 
All oh, right, okay. Sorry, I had to have, we talk about that. Yeah, but you get, you get that. We have enough of that within, U, within the UK, let alone going to Syria or any other places. These people are whatever, you know, I'll let you see what they are. But however, you know, there's, there's radicalization going at different levels. Yeah, going to Syria is one extreme, but radicalization can happen within our own doorsteps. And people don't have to go to Syria for that. But however, to, 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 to kind of end, to kind of help to diffuse that again role for parents in the community is that we have to have mechanisms there where we can support people and um, uh, families as well and one other thing if we don't if we're not careful and this is i think um people who brothers who are from the middle east or who have studied in the middle east know that you know issues like this radicalization happens all the time there it's almost like a part of the culture there to a certain degree it's not happened here in the UK because we've not had that, you know, need for it. Recent, but in recent times, that's changed. And if we're not careful, we can use, lose a lot of rights and a lot of freedom through this. And that worries me because then we'll turn into countries like, I'm um, saying about Saudi. I lived there for a very long time. I know what happens in that country. I um, spoke about the beheadings. Those people have been beheaded over the last God knows months. Probably, if you're lucky, one Saudi. The rest have all been foreign nationals for whatever reasons. Because, again, there's no justice in a lot of these countries. We still have justice in this country to a certain degree. And we've got to utilise it and use it in the best way possible. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. I guess a lot has been said already, so I won't, pro I won't re reiterate everything. Um, but it comes down to education. And I think that's something that we need to kind of focus on a lot in terms of educating young people and even parents as well, like um, Brother Shockett mentioned, there's a lot of, even uh, me as a youngish person, I can't keep up with the trends of WhatsApp and Kick and Facebook and they're all laughing. But you know, I can't keep up with it. And there's a lot, and so maybe there's some sort of seminars and workshops and how we can use these things and facilitate these things in a way that is appropriate for young people and parents can maybe be educated on how to keep on top of them. Um, as well as that, as a community, we should be backing um, I syllabus or you know moderate places of moderate education um, and trying to get young people to join things like I syllabus because that's where the knowledge that's the correct knowledge and uh, there's no need to go on the internet when you've got such an accessible and two very accessible sheikhs in, in Glasgow so there's no need for the internet to gain Islamic knowledge and that's something that needs to be jumped into young people as well um, so it's about the community coming together and supporting projects like that um, and again it all comes down to educating young people and parents as well. It's one of these things that, you, that the history is made up of anomalies you can't really go back and try and turn back the clock but I think what we have to realise is in, 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 in Scotland specifically in Glasgow even more specifically we have amazing potential human potential and we have to utilise that. And as a beacon, I think, I really do believe that Scotland has this um, quality of being a source of light for the Muslim communities in, 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 in Britain and also, I think, in the West and America as well. And I think that happens through community organisations working on the same platform, constantly communicating, networking to the point that when people see the community in Glasgow, they see a vibrant community. And that's my, you know, inshallah, my aim is to have a, a community here that people look up to and speak about. And also when I go back down to London, Bradford, Birmingham, they do, they speak about it and they say you've got this amazing institution there, you've got this project here, we've heard a lot about it. And that, I think that's what we have to do because at the end of the day, somebody's gone, gone abroad and they've been caught embroiled in this whole scenario. This is an issue, regardless of whether that girl had gone out or not, it's still an issue that we have people that sow the seeds of, of sectarian conflicts. And we have people, you know, it's not just Anjum Chowdhury, he's, he's, a, he's a clown, he's not, he doesn't have any knowledge. You, you, you listen to him speak and you're just thinking, well, is that all you've got? And then I, then I think, why is no scholar standing and, and, and debating with this person? And I, was, I actually mentioned to a group of scholars in England, they, they get together and they said, well, we decided not to speak on the same platform as that person. I said, well, what's the point then of you existing? If you can't go up and, and, and discuss with this person, and destroy them in five minutes, there's no point in you studying six, seven years. So I think we have to, people that have the ability to do things, they have to step up to the mark. And one of the, uh, the last thing probably is to make dua for her family. It's a very important thing that there's, you know, we're here to make supplications that, that Allah eases their, their suffering and their, and their sorrow and brings, brings their back and brings the, you know, the, the light back into their life that's been taken away, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> 
اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد في الاولين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على في الاخرين pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes his blessing a blessed, a blessing, a blessed gathering we ask, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he alleviates the, the suffering of her family we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protects the community in Glasgow and in Scotland we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives everybody here what they desire subhanahu rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun alayhi wa sallim alhamdulillah rabbil alayhi wa sallim 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 wa sall